This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You are going to hear a conversation about purchasing a cellular phone. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Before we start the test, look at the example of your question booklet and listen to the tape. Excuse me, can you give me some information about purchasing a cellular phone? Of course, my pleasure. We carry all sorts of phones, from the most basic phones to very sophisticated web-enabled phones. I will do my best to help you find a phone that suits your needs. In the tape, the man says he will purchase a cellular phone. Therefore, A is the correct answer. Now we will play the whole recording. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 1 to 6. Excuse me, can you give me some information about purchasing a cellular phone? Of course, my pleasure. We carry all sorts of phones, from the most basic phones to very sophisticated web-enabled phones. I will do my best to help you find a phone that suits your needs. Thanks. I'm looking for two cellular phones, one for me and one for my son. I think I won't need anything too sophisticated, just your basic phone functions. But maybe my son will like something with more functions. Sure, well, let's take a look. So you have no preferences at all? What about the size or colour? How about the brand? Well, I don't really care what brand the cell phone is, but I guess I don't want anything that's too big or too small. I want a phone that can fit nicely in my hand and in my pocket. If it's too big, it might be too heavy, and if it's too small, I might lose it. Colour, I don't really care about either. Well, I don't want a pink phone. Ah, OK, so let's look for something suitable for a working person. How about this one? This one is the R55. It is black, not too big, not too small, all the usual functions. The best feature of the R55 is that it can be used worldwide, even in Europe or Asia. It looks good. How much does it cost? It is only $100. If you sign up for a calling plan, then we will give you a $50 discount on the phone. How old is this model, though? I don't want anything that's too old. This model was introduced into the market about three years ago, so it is a bit older, but be assured it will still work fine. Well, I think I still want something not as old. How about from last year? Any good phones from around that time? Yes, there are some. How about this one? It's the new model of the phone you just looked at, called the W55. Most of the features are the same. There are some new features on the W55, though. The battery will last up to two days longer, and the overall weight of the phone is lighter. How much is this one? This is selling for $150. If you purchase it along with a phone plan, then it will be only a hundred dollars. OK, I think I'll take this one. Now, I need to pick up a phone for my son. I think he'll want something more trendy, so how about a new model for him? Nothing too extravagant or expensive, though. This right here is the newest offering from the leading company in the cellular phone business. The phone is called the Rocket. It is well suited for teenage users. Among the teen-friendly features are ten songs to choose from a free messaging system that allows friends to send texts to each other and voice recognition dialing. The thing most younger users like about the Rocket is that it has a screen that changes colours. All this for only $100 with a purchase of a one-year phone plan. Sounds like something my son will like. Can I sign us both up at once? Yes, of course. Both of you can share one plan. You will pay only $50 a month for both of you to share a plan. That's it? Only $50 a month? Yes, that's all.
Now look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 7 to 10. OK. I will need your information. Name and address, please. Richard Derek Jones. What's your profession? I'm an engineer. Address, please. 322 First Street, San Francisco, California. And phone number, please. 621-360-7673. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong number. 621-360-7610. How many phones do you want activated onto your plan? Two for now. Thank you very much. Your phones will be ready in a minute. That is the end of part one. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a talk on the radio about grass roofs. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. And now it's straight into the eco hotspot for today's program. We are in fact going to look at an intriguing trend in recent years in the world of eco-friendly developments. There has been a constant stream of new green products coming onto the market for the environmentally conscious. A new departure, which I feel needs greater attention drawn to it, is the increasing interest in grass roofs. Environmentalists sing the praises of grass roofs as interest in sustainable ecological building has led to the greening of the rooftops of residential and commercial buildings around the world. And what does this type of roof consist of? Instead of tiles, which allow water to run off and create flash flooding, the roof has a waterproof underlay, which is laid over the roof deck. This waterproof layer is then covered with layers for insulation and drainage. Then, on top of the insulation and drainage layer, is added a final layer of soil or crushed stones for the plants and or grass to grow on. The roof can be planted with wildflowers to add colour and life to your rooftop. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 14 to 20. As for the benefits of grass roofs, in spring and in summer they are very pretty as flowers spring into bloom. Moreover, in summer, grass roofs are of particular benefit in cities because they keep any building cool by reflecting the sun's rays. In winter, the grass roofs insulate the building helping to prevent heat loss. The roofs require little maintenance and are better than any other roofing material. They encourage biodiversity by attracting bees and birds, and they absorb water runoff 
which helps prevent flash flooding. In fact, the gravel layer retains 71% of the rainwater that falls, thus helping to prevent flash flooding. In winter, the brown soil is a bit more evident, which can look unattractive if the roofs are not tended carefully. But that is a price worth paying, and I would say that they come highly recommended by those who have them. If you compare grass roofs with tiles, the latter do certainly look very tidy, but at a price to the future of the planet. The main drawbacks of tiles, though, are the water runoff and the absorption of heat from the sun's rays in summer. So, if we are to save the planet from the ecological point of view, tiles do not come recommended. The only roof that I can think of which has similar ecological credentials to the grass roof is the thatched roof. Thatched roofs are good insulators and very attractive, but very pricey and not ideal for cities. How can we make more of our roofs green? That is, how can people be persuaded to install grass roofs? The World Green Roof Conference in Australia was a very good start. At a grass roots level, the best way to raise the profile of grass roofs is to make them trendy by highlighting them in fashionable magazines so that people begin to feel that they cannot do without them. But the idea I like best is holding competitions for the best designed grass roofs. Next week, Eco Hotspot is going to look at... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a female and a male student talking about the mock exams that they have just taken. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, what did you think of the practice exams last week? You mean the mock exams? Yeah. I thought some of them were tough. They were certainly hard and generally they were very long. Yeah, they were spread over a whole week, which made it impossible to relax. Exactly. But what did you think of each test? Of the seven exams we did? The least enjoyable for me were the two three-hour essay papers. Why didn't you like the essay papers? I'm not particularly good at writing things down like that in a short space of time. And I don't think it's a good way of testing our theoretical knowledge of medicine. I'm the opposite, I'm afraid. I'm much better in the written essay exams than the other types of tests. But what about the two multiple-choice exam papers in basic science and anatomy? They weren't too bad. If you didn't know the answer, all you had to do was guess. Mm, that's OK, but I never feel comfortable with guessing. And you know that there is research that shows that women are disadvantaged when doing multiple choice questions compared to men. You've mentioned this before, but I'm not sure I believe it. It's true. Multiple choice questions benefit men more than women. They are a male construct. If you say so. It's not if I say so. Anyway, you have to be careful with multiple choice questions because of the negative marking. That can really bring the score down if you keep guessing and get all of the guesses wrong. It's double negative. Yeah, that is a danger. What about the role play? Did you like that? Yeah, 
with the actors and actresses as simulated patients, yeah, I thought that was by far the best part of the exam. Why was that? What I liked about it was during the 24 test stations, we had a chance to show what we know about communicating with patients and show our practical medical knowledge, etc. Yes, I think I agree with you there. I enjoyed all of the stations, but I can tell you I was tired at the end. I have done a practice exam with 12 test stations, but not 24. It was exhausting, but also exhilarating. I agree completely. It lasted nearly four hours in total with the break. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What did you think of the other two exams? The two problem-solving tests? Hmm, I didn't think I was going to handle them very well. But in the end, I think they went better than I thought they would. What I liked most was the test where we had to work in groups of four and to solve a problem, we had to prioritise actions. That was very interesting. I'm not sure that I did very well in that, though. Did you feel comfortable being in a group of four and having four examiners watching you as you discuss the problem? We did practice it several times before. You learn to forget that someone is watching you. But some people are better at speaking in group situations like that and they get the best marks. The test doesn't just assess whether people can talk a lot. It's about showing you can listen organize your thoughts and then show you can be part of a team, allowing other people to speak. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. When do the results of the mocks come out? They said next week, and then it's the finals two weeks later. Yeah, we've got that to look forward to. What is the policy on resets? Why? Are you planning to fail? No, but, well, you know what I mean. The resets are held in September, and if there is any problem after that... It goes to appeal. We'll just have to make sure we don't fail any part of the whole examination. I certainly wouldn't want to do any of it again. Me neither. It's hard when you are not allowed to fail any of the exams. I bet they don't have that policy in any other subject. Probably not. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. In this section, you'll hear an introduction on the adventure class. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to Adventure Class. I'm the coordinator of the class. During the course of this morning, I hope to give you a clear idea of what we offer in our class. Before my lecture, listen to the comments on the class. Today we sailed into a group of whales. Class takes place in the middle of elephants, giraffes and hippos. 
Yesterday's lecture was at the Great Barrier Reef. Do these comments sound like your typical classroom? Probably not. These accounts come from students studying in adventure classes. An adventure class is a unique type of program that combines textbook learning with real-life exploration. Students and teachers travel together for a program in discovery and exploration. The class is provided by the Australian University's International Program. Aiming at promoting students' awareness of international communication and global environment. Here are three popular adventure classroom programs that are available to you, college students from the freshmen to senior students. The first one is called Australia Short Program. The three-week course begins with several days in Cairns. There we hold classes on coral protection, how the corals are formed. What are their functions, and what are the threats corals are facing? Students then spend the next two weeks on a study tour of Queensland. Known for its sunny beaches, rainforests, and remote outback, Queensland provides a rich learning environment. The highlight of the program is the tour to the Great Barrier Reef. Activities include hiking, bird watching, and boating. By experiencing local culture up close. Students explore the connection between local people and the environment. Six semester credits are given by the Australian University's International Program, and the tuition fee is one thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars. African Safari Program is another popular class. Kenya's stunning wilderness becomes the classroom for students in the African Safari Program. The five-week course is set on the beautiful twenty-acre campus of Australia International University in Nairobi. University professors combine classroom instruction with hands-on experience to teach wildlife management. In addition to classwork, students take trips to famous places such as Mount Kilimanjaro and Victoria Falls. Students also experience African culture through trips to local villages and Nairobi's city centre. But for most students, the safaris are the highlight of the course. The program includes three or four safaris. During each safari, participants camp outdoors for up to six days. One of the most popular destinations is the Masai Mara Game Reserve. An amazing collection of wildlife lives on the reserve. Students study elephants, zebras, giraffes, rhinos, and other exotic animals in their natural habitat. Those who take the course gain many wonderful memories and a greater appreciation for the Earth's natural resources. Students earn eight college credits for the program. The cost of tuition is four thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars. The last on the list is Sea Education Association (SEA). The SEA program is a one-of-a-kind opportunity where students live and learn aboard a tall ship. The course combines ocean research with instruction and personal experience in sailing. After careful instruction, both on shore and at sea, the participants begin practicing what they've learned. Everyone on board takes turns operating and navigating a 134-foot sailing ship. That is the most outstanding. Life at sea is non-stop, so everyone is assigned to a watch. During that time, students work in the lab, in the kitchen, on deck, or in the engine room. Each watch group includes eight people who rotate throughout a twenty-four hour schedule. They learn how to live at sea and how to work together as a team. Students can choose from three programs in different locations, each about three weeks long. College credit is awarded, and the cost is three thousand six hundred U.S. dollars. Is an adventure classroom for you? If the idea of learning through adventure interests you, you might want to apply. It would certainly be an experience you would never forget. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.